Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Mr and Mrs MEP, the EU Assembly's new book for small children. EU names new envoys in Africa. And asylum seekers are costing one and a half million pounds a day. Romania, EU launch works on world's most powerful laser. Plus, in our legislation section, credit institutions and prudential supervision. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage, I would like to share a new glossy European Union book with you. It's aimed at small children and it's called Mr and Mrs MEP and their helpers. <laughs> this kind of propaganda aimed at the young usually achieves little more than self-parody, never more so than in the EU, especially so when produced by the European Parliament. The book includes a selection of the colouring exercises and rosy spectacled insights into the life of an MEP. Contrast these colouring exercises with the reality of MEPs arriving at the end of a working day to pocket a tax-free £258 per day allowance, as caught on television by a Dutch journalist. The limos are real. MEPs share them and senior Euro deputies can choose their own. Former presidents of the European Parliament get their own personal VIP car for their entire career. So the question is, how many people does it take to send a letter in the EU Assembly? Answer, four. An MEP, an assistant, a messenger and the postal service. Twelve new European Union ambassadors were named today, most of them, to postings in Africa. The appointments, which are part of the annual rotation of officials in the European External Action Service, involve one high-level change in the headquarters of the EU's diplomatic service. Michael Pulch, a German who was once deputy head of the EU's mission to China, will leave his position of director of the Russia division to become ambassador to Singapore. The post was previously held by Mark Ungoer of Luxembourg, whose next move has not been announced. The largest country affected is Nigeria. Its new ambassador will be Michael Arian. With serving ambassador to Rwanda, Arian, who is Belgium, was previously head of the delegation in the Ivory Coast and in Liberia. EU interests in Africa continue to develop and the extent of EU involvement in the continent is far-reaching. This brings with it a significant burden of cost to the EU taxpayer. Whilst at least four countries in the African continent now have free trade agreements, many others are repressed by trade tariffs. Africa is rapidly developing into a primary global resource for which there is heavy competition from the USA, EU and China. A search on our site for Africa reveals a large number of articles, funding rounds and other significant diplomatic involvement. The Home Office had to fork out 583 million on 37,000 asylum claims the Daily Express can reveal. Two of the three cases of people trying to stay in the UK were more than a year old and nearly 14,000 had waited at least three years according to official figures. The money went on housing, cash support, legal bills and paperwork. But the total does not include asylum seekers' legal aid bills, the cash spent on them by councils or the cost of a backlog of hundreds of thousands of other migration cases. Campaigners yesterday condemned the huge costs of would-be refugees, roughly £14,500 per case. Matthew Sinclair of the Taxpayers' Alliance said the best way to reduce the cost of the asylum system is to ensure decisions are made swiftly and fairly. Sadly, the UK Border Agency is responsible for a backlog of cases bogged down in bureaucracy. This costs taxpayers a fortune and leads to some cases being successful just because of the delays. For too long, the burden and pernicious effect of this backlog combined with EU legislation has been allowed to mount. Euro MP Gerard Batten, UKIP's Home Affairs spokesman, said half a billion pounds is an extraordinary amount of money. 
This cost is only going to amount further because the EU is laying down more laws to strengthen rules for us to follow and grant sanctuary to ever-growing numbers. The European Union and Romania have laid the cornerstones of a research hub due to host the world's most powerful laser. The project is of particular importance not only for Romania and also for Europe as a whole. European Commissioner for Regional Policy Johannes Hahn told a press conference alongside Romania's Prime Minister Victor Ponta. Its cutting-edge technology will be used by researchers all over the world, he added. Known as Extreme Light Infrastructure Nuclear Physics, it will serve as a pan-European laboratory and host a broad range of scientific disciplines including fundamental physics, new nuclear physics and astrophysics, but also life sciences. In our legislation section, we have a new report, Credit Institutions and Prudential Supervision. The report was written for and adopted by the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. The opinions were sought from the Committee on Legal Affairs, however, none were forthcoming. The report is concerned with the proposal for a directive of the European Parliament and of the Council on the access to the activity of credit institutions and the prudential supervision of credit institutions and investment firms and amending Directive 2002-87-EC of the European Parliament and of the Council on the supplementary supervision of credit institutions, insurance undertakings, investment firm in a financial conglomerate. More EU elvish legalese. <laughs> so what does it all mean? Well, it provides the EU with the power to investigate the activities and governance of financial institutions and impose sanctions upon these institutions where they are found to be not complying with the directives. Today in our video library, in light of the upcoming legislation with regard to credit institutions of prudential supervision, we thought it would be worthwhile taking a different view on how governments might approach the financial collapse. Current doctrine favours the imposition of austerity and further austerity should the patient deteriorate. Something of a medieval approach to economic recovery, our politicians are simply conducting round after round of public sector bloodletting. Little wonder the patient is looking pale and sick. So, is there another way? Well, it seems so. In this video interview, the President of Iceland takes us through the actions taken by the Icelandic people and government and demonstrates how a rapid economic recovery can take place. The moral of the story is to let the private banks fail. After all, it was their decision to take irresponsible risk with funds that they did not have. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. You can get lots more news stories and information on our website, theunit.com. You can get in touch with us there and we particularly welcome your letters and points of view. You can follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter username is the E Unit. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for all of our regular updates. You can join me and the rest of the team for interactive discussion and debate on Google Plus at any time. Are you looking for a public speaker for your event? Our public speakers are happy to come and discuss Britain's relationship with the EU in your area at no cost. If you would like to add interest and value to your group event, then get in touch with us via the Word section of our website. Join us in our live Question Time style online show, The Unit Interactive. Broadcast live on our website, theunit.com, and globally via thehangoutshow.com. Join our community on Google+, and you can be part of the wider public voice, united in freedom, liberty, and independence. Simply join our community, the unit on Google+, links to the community page are below.